Don't be in a, in a race to finish something. Sometimes you got to meditate on God's Word. Sometimes you read a chapter and the next day you got to go back and reread it again. Prayer is our connection to omnipotence. That's why we need to pray. If people don't pray, if Christians don't pray, what is that saying? We bless your name, Lord Jesus. Father, we're here to meet with you, and you're so faithful to meet with us, oh God. Father, there's a lot of things, oh God, that are on our hearts and on our minds. Too many, oh God, for even us to keep up with, but you are God. And Lord, you can take it all in, oh God, and you have something for each one of us, oh God. Lord, there's none of us that enter into your presence that leave the same way, oh God. Hallelujah. Have your way tonight. Continue to have your way, Lord God. We will continue, Father, to praise you and to lift up your name. We love you, Lord. And we ask these things, Lord God, in Jesus' name, in the name of Jesus. And the people of God said, I will fall at your feet and I will worship you, King. Amen. I want to just uh, share a word that the Lord put on my heart this morning. As I was reading the Word of God, I was <clears throat> reading about King Asa, and King Asa was one of the few good kings. Uh, there were the 10 northern tribes uh, called Israel, and they started off on the wrong foot with a king named King Jeroboam, and it was downhill from there. Every other king that followed King Jeroboam led Israel down the wrong path, and they wound up being exiled and wiped out. Judah had evil kings, but they also had some good kings. There were about eight good kings, and King Asa was one of them. And the Bible tells us that when he took over, he started to clean out the land and all of that. And the land had peace. Judah had peace for a number of years. But then uh, uh, an Ethiopian man named Zira led an army, ready, of a million men against Judah. And if you can ma imagine an army of a million, now Judah had some men in the fighting army, but they were no match for that number of people. So uh, Asa called out to the Lord, and God did a miracle. He intervened, and he all but destroyed the Ethiopian army. And something that's so different, I saw as I continued reading, that's chapter 14 of Second Chronicles. As you read chapter 15, something different happens there that I want to talk to us about tonight and get some lessons from this story. As the king and the men were coming back from the victory, they were heading back to Jerusalem, they were returning to Jerusalem from the battle. We read in 2 Chronicles chapter 15, verses 1 and 2, and then I'm going to read verses 8 through 12. It says this, The Spirit of God came on Azariah, son of Obed. Azariah was a prophet. He went out to meet Asa and said to him, Listen to me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you. When you are with him, if you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. And then verses 3 to 7, which we're not going to read about. The Lord is reminding Asa and the army of when Israel failed and turned away and the things that happened. But God said, I will reward you when you follow me. And then we pick up in verse 8. It says, when Asa heard this message from Azariah the prophet, he took courage and removed all the detestable idols 
from the land of Judah and Benjamin, and in the towns he had captured in the hill country of Ephraim. And he repaired the altar of the Lord, which stood in front of the entry room of the Lord's temple. Then Asa called together all the people of Judah and Benjamin, along with the people of Ephraim, Manasseh, and Simeon, who had settled among them, for many from Israel had moved to Judah during Asa's reign when they saw that the Lord his God was with him. The people gathered at Jerusalem in late spring during the 15th year of Asa's reign. On that day, they sacrificed to the Lord 700 cattle and 7,000 sheep and goats from the plunder they had taken in the battle. Then they entered into a covenant to seek the Lord, the God of their ancestors, with all their heart and soul. So here we have an incredible victory, and they're heading back to Jerusalem in victory, and God sends a message. The first thing I want to remark to us from this story is that we can't forget God after a time of victory or blessing. Don't forget God after a time of victory or blessing. God had to say something, and he said it for a reason. The message from the Lord to Asa was immediate. In other words, he didn't wait until King Asa and the army got back and settled in and got comfortable in their victory. They weren't even back yet. They were on their way, and God sent the prophet to remind them what they needed to do. The Lord is with you when you are with them, he reminded them. Very strange because they were with God at that point. But God is reminding them. First of all, we, we, we need to know that when you call out to God, God hears and he answers. How many say amen? If you read in, in, in chapter 14, when Asa saw what was coming against him and against Judah, he lifted up a prayer. He was getting ready to face a million-man army, and this is what he prayed in 2 Chronicles 14, starting in verse 11. It says, Then Asa cried out to the Lord his God, O oh Lord, no one but you can help the powerless against the mighty. Help us, O oh Lord our God, for we trust in you alone. It is in your name that we have come against this vast horde. O oh Lord, you are our God. Do not let mere men prevail against you. So the Lord defeated the Ethiopians in the presence of Asa and the army of Judah, and the enemy fled. It starts out with prayer. You pray when you're in trouble, when the odds are against you. You pray and God answers prayer. I love that God answers prayer. I wish more people would believe that God answers prayer. Like I've said before, if people really believe that, this place would be, you need a police outside to, to, to uh, take traffic, to regulate traffic. But you know what? The Bible says we don't have because we don't ask. We don't have because we don't have enough faith. But you know what? All it takes, folks, is a remnant. God always uses a remnant to wake up everybody else. Right? And I want to be a part of that remnant. How about you? Amen. Know that when you call to God, God hears and he answers. How many can testify of something recent that God has done for you. I got both hands up. God has done so much recently. Oh my goodness, I can't keep up. Amen? Know also that the Lord is watching to see how you handle his blessings and the success that he gives you. He's watching. The Bible says that the Spirit of the Lord came on Azariah the prophet. In other words, God was using his man, this prophet, to speak directly to King Asa and to the army. God wanted them to know something. He's watching. He wants you to know that he cares about how you react. 
Are you going to forget him? Are you going to uh, get all caught up in the blessing or the success that he gave you? Boy, I know so many people like that. In all my years of ministry, who God blesses tremendously, and then you don't see him anymore. They were there when there was a need. They were there. They wouldn't miss. All of a sudden, God blesses. He answers. Boom, gone. And eventually, they get in trouble again. God himself was speaking to Asa and reminding him to stay close to him. Here's something else that we learn and we should know. That God is always with you. How many say amen? When, he, when you are with him. He is always with you when you are with him. There, there's a caveat. There, there, there's a condition. People think that God has, doesn't have conditions. Oh, yes, he does. The word of God says, right? What does the word of God say in James? Draw near to me, and I will draw near to you. Right? God is always with you when you are with him. So don't forget God after a time of victory or blessing. Amen? Amen. Here's another lesson. Take courage when God is with you and take action to put away idols. We read in the first part of verse 8 of 2 Chronicles 15 the following. When Asa heard this message from Azariah the prophet, he took courage and removed all the detestable idols from the land of Judah and Benjamin and in the towns he had captured in the hill country of Ephraim. Many times you have to go against the grain and against the tide of what most people are doing and you have to stand up for what is right. And that takes courage many times. As far as things concern you, meaning your home, your children, what you allow your children to do or see or look at, what you permit to go on among your friends. You know, we need some more killjoys. You know what a killjoy is? It's somebody trying to have fun and somebody kind of throws a wrench into it. But you know what? There's appropriate times of good times and then there's things that are not appropriate. How many say amen? Amen. And it takes a good follower of Christ when they're with his friends, but he has to have courage. When they start going to the left, going the wrong way, hey, wait a minute, you know what? That's not right. That's not right. We shouldn't do that. The word says, right? Not go along. When you go along, you all wind up on the wrong road. When it takes courage to do that, it takes courage to stand up for what's right, especially when most People are going along with the idols of the land. We see that today, right? Many Christians have been lured away with the culture and denying the word of God and saying that God is evolving and doing something else when God has already spoken. Listen, you're not loving anybody if you're not telling them the truth. Like the word of God says, you will never hear condemnation from this pulpit because Jesus didn't come into the world to condemn the world but to save the world but Jesus spoke plainly and he spoke spoke the truth you know why because he loved his creation and if you love somebody you have to tell them the truth because it's only the truth that sets you free right if my if if somebody that I love is heading at 100 miles an hour towards a bridge that is out, is broken, and uh, you would plunge into the depths, but they wanted, to, they wanted to go at 100 miles an hour and cross that bridge. Uh, would I say, oh, well, you know, he's having fun in the car. He just got a turbocharged car. It's a Ferrari, and he wants to try it out. I mean, who am I to stop him? Go ahead, enjoy it. No, you say, hey, stop, stop. The bridge is out ahead, and if you continue going, you're going to kill yourself. Ah, you're always messing with my fun. No, it's not that. It's that I love you. I don't want you to die. And forget about dying physically. That's one thing. But we're talking about eternity. Amen? The truth matters for eternity. 
Amen? It takes courage to tell the truth. You know what? Asa wasn't messing around. He even corrected Granny. His grandmother, 2 Chronicles 15, 16, says King Asa even deposed his grandmother Mecca from her position as queen mother because she had made an obscene Asherah pole. He cut down her obscene pole, broke it up, and burned it in the Kidron Valley. If you have family members that are doing things that they're not supposed to do. You know, when I was a child, I had family members that were involved in witchcraft. Um, you know, Spanish Santeria. And you know what my mother did? She separated us from the family that was involved with that. She didn't want us around. God bless her for keeping us out of darkness. And I remember one place, you know, where uh, uh, it was a real close family. So we used to go there sometimes. And they had like a shrine in the room. And I remember I would stay out of that room because I felt something in there. As a little boy, there was something going on in there. But my mom protected us and she separated us away from all of that. Even if it's family. Hey, guess what? Light and darkness don't mix. How many say amen? King Asa knew that and he even deposed his grandmother. So you have to take courage and take action to put away idols. How many say amen? And then I want to just key in here and we're going to end here. Because this is the main thing that I wanted to leave with all of us. Is that we need to make necessary repairs to our altar with God. You and I need to make the necessary repairs to our altar with God. Second Chronicles 15, the second part of verse 8 says, And he, Asa, repaired the altar of the Lord, which stood in front of the entry room, of the Lord's temple. Unattended altars fall into disrepair. Unattended altars fall into disrepair. You know, I was commenting uh, some months back about homes, houses, right? I don't know what it is about houses, but have you ever noticed a house when a family moves out and that house remains empty for a good amount of time. The house starts to look deteriorated. It's almost like somebody sucked the life out of that physical house. It looks down. There's a house where I live on, on the block where I live. And, and I guess some big company is buying the property. So the house is empty. There's some blocks there blocking the way to the driveway. That used to be a pretty house. Nobody did anything to it. The windows aren't broken, but it looks deteriorated. And the altar, our altar with God gets deteriorated from lack of use, from neglect, from being left alone, from being uncared for. Amen? All sorts of things start to grow. Weeds. Broken down things. Let me tell you, your altar with the Lord represents any occasion or any place that you have had a personal encounter with God. Any occasion where you've had a personal encounter with God. Any place where you have had a personal encounter with God. That's your altar with the Lord. And while it's good to have a place where you go to meet with God regularly, that's a good thing. But the main thing is that your heart becomes an altar to the Lord. Your heart consecrated to God becomes an altar to the Lord. In other words, your very heart is the altar before God. Timmy, if you'd come. I want to help us pray tonight. I want to repair our altars. There, there, there are areas that we have let deteriorate a little bit. Let me describe 
your altar with God. It's where you personally meet with him. Where you personally meet with God. I love the fact, and I know there's people that don't personally meet with him. There are Christians that I know that have not personally met with him. In fact, they tell me that they feel like God is far away. You ever hear somebody say that? They say they're Christians, but God is far away. And I always say this from my own life, from my own experience. God is far away when you have moved away from him. That's when God is far away. He doesn't move away from you. How many know that? Just look at the story in scripture that Jesus said about the prodigal son. What happened with the prodigal son? Did the father leave the son? Or did the son leave the father? And when was it that they were reunited again? Is when the son came back to the father. The father is always there. He doesn't leave. But you and I can leave the father. Your altar is where you meet with your God. It's where you make things right with him. You ever mess up? Just a little bit, maybe. Doesn't have to be big. You know where you make things right? At your altar with God. All you got to do is tell him, I love the fact, and we can't take this or abuse it, but it's just a plain fact. God's grace is so amazing. You know what 1 John 1, 9 says? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That happens at your altar with God. You meet with him there. You repent there. You make things right with him there. It's where you, you cultivate a heart of worship. Let me tell you something. Anybody that waits for church to worship God isn't prepared. You know what, what worship is supposed to be for all of us? It's the outgrowth of what we've been doing all along. The outgrowth of our life. That's why it should be so powerful that we should raise the roof. You're not first worshiping God when you get here. We're just doing it together now. You understand? As the body of Christ. People think that worship is something that you do in church. You sing three songs or four songs and that's worship. That's not worship. We're singing and we're worshiping God. But your life is a life of worship. And guess where that worship is cultivated? Your altar with God. When you spend time with him, when his presence comes in the altar, when you meet with him, your heart turns to worship. It must you know what? The Bible says that one day, right, every knee will bow. People are not going to do that uh, willingly. In other words, when Jesus appears in the sky, there are going to be people that hate Jesus. But you know what's going to happen to their knees? Without They're just going to collapse. It's what's going to happen. Because when God's presence is there, what happens is worship must happen. Because as we were singing, worthy is his name. Worthy to be praised and adored. And by the way, you and I were made to worship him. Those that learn how to worship God, oh my goodness, Nobody has to tell you. Nobody has, hey, it's time to worship God now. Or just try to stop a worshiper. You can't do it. Worship begins at your personal altar with God. Your altar with God is your place of consecration. It's where you maintain your devotion to God. You know, people get away from God. You know why they get away from God? 
they neglect their altar with God. They neglect it. And if you neglect it, you will get away. We're just wired that way. We just have to make peace with that. We're wired to wander. But it's where we consecrate ourselves. It's the place of intercession. You want to learn how to pray for more than three minutes without running out of things to say? Become an intercessor. How many knees are there around the world? Just if you prayed for just the people that are in this auditorium right now, who you see, you will spend a good amount of time in prayer. In fact, you won't have enough time. And then there's Christians around the world. Oh, and then there's all the lost souls in the world, all the lost souls in Imesville and, and, and Gaithersburg and, and Germantown and, and Newmarket and Frederick and Damascus and Mount Airy. Do you ever pray for lost souls? Did God ever put a burden on your heart for those that are heading to hell without knowing the truth that we know? How about if we spend some time praying for that? How about if we spend some time praying for the place where we live, the governments that are going nuts? There's so many things. That's intercession, and intercession happens at your altar with God. And your altar with God is where you offer sacrifices, where you offer up your sacrifices. After the altar was repaired, we read in in chapter 15 of 2 Chronicles, verses 10 and 11, the people gathered at Jerusalem in late spring. During the 15th year of Asa's reign, on that day they sacrificed to the Lord 700 cattle and 7,000 sheep and goats from the plunder they had taken in the battle. Today we don't offer up animals. That's over, thank God. Because Jesus offered up the ultimate sacrifice himself. No more sacrifice is needed, but we can offer up a living sacrifice. Romans 12, 1, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. There it is again. Worship. How? Offering your body as a living sacrifice. What does that mean? Living in holiness. Well, how do you do that? Being filled with the Holy Spirit. Giving God complete control of your life. You and I can't do it. But he certainly can do it in you and in me. Amen? How many are changed because Jesus changed you? How many are in the sanctifying process? Raise your hand. Your work in progress, but you are in progress. Make sure you're in progress. We won't be complete until we see him face to face. But be in progress. Don't be like a lot of construction sites that you pass by. Famous in New York City. You see all the cones. You see all the signs. But you don't see any men working. (laughs) It's like that for years. And it's like that here too. But I love works in progress because God is doing something and he's a patient God. He's teaching us. He's, you know, I'm not the same person I was 10 years ago or even two years ago or even a year ago. I'm a work in progress and you are works in progress. You offer up a living sacrifice. Then you offer up a sacrifice of praise. Hebrews 13, 15. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise. And listen to the following words. The fruit of lips that openly profess his name. I know somebody that got upset with me because I was saying that you should praise God out loud. And the person got upset with me because he was saying, you don't have to praise God out loud. Meanwhile, the person was a loud mouth. Just loud. But when it comes to God, all the loudness disappeared. He, 
you know, didn't want to uh, or, or got offended that I said that. You know what? God gave you breath. And the Bible says, let everything that have breath praise the Lord. Thank God that he can read our mind. Thank God that we're in certain situations you can whisper or you can even think your prayers. But there's something about speaking your prayers. There's something about speaking praise to God. Using the lungs that are functioning solely because God meant for them to function. He's maintaining you, uh, your heart beating and your lungs filling with air and exhaling and inhaling that we can give that back to God in worship for all that he's doing for us. You know, you're alive because he wills for you to be alive. How many say amen? Let's continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise. Then a sacrifice of thanksgiving. A living sacrifice, a sacrifice of praise, and a sacrifice of thanksgiving. Psalm 116, 17 says, I will offer you a sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. What's that? We've spoken about that before. A sacrifice of thanksgiving is giving thanks to God for everything. Those of you that have been through some trials, maybe you've learned that even during the trial, you can thank God. Why? Because he promised certain things. He promised that he would work all things together. For who? For anybody? For the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So if you're one of those people who love him and are called according to his purpose, you can thank God even through a trial because he's going to work it all out for your good. I'm a living testimony of that, and I know many of you are. How many can raise your hand and testify that God works all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose? There's proof. My own life is a proof. I just love, I was telling somebody on Sunday, I just love that I could just speak the truth because if what I was saying wasn't the truth, I didn't read it in a book. They didn't teach me in seminary. God taught me his faithfulness. Even when I was unfaithful, God remained faithful. He taught me about his goodness when I didn't deserve a lick of his goodness. How many can testify with me about God's mercy and grace? And finally, your altar with God is where you renew your covenant with God. Second Chronicles 15, 12 says, Then they entered into a covenant to seek the Lord, the God of their ancestors, with all their heart and soul. These were people of the covenant. The covenant was from Abraham. We're living in the new covenant with Jesus Christ. But those folks... Ada and Judah, Asa and Judah, they were in the covenant, covered under the covenant of, that God made with Abraham. Why then does it say that they entered into a covenant to seek the Lord? You know why? Because we get away from God. We, we forget about him. We make mistakes. We wander. We don't give him praise. We don't stay devoted. So there's a time when God makes that real to you like he did to them. He was reminding them. And you know what they did? They made a covenant with their God. And what what did they say? They said, to seek the Lord. That's what the covenant was. The God of their ancestors. How? With all their heart and soul. Wherever your altar needs to be repaired, God is speaking to us today. Don't forget me. When I bless you, don't forget me. When I give you success, don't forget me. When you prayed for that thing and I answered, don't forget me. Why is God insecure? Absolutely not. It's because he knows that if we forget him, we will begin on that road to destruction. That's just what happens to us. Amen. It's because he loves us that he tells us that. 
I want to pray tonight. I want us to pray. And we, I'm going to pray. You know, I've been praying that God would raise up us up as a church of intercessors. As a church that goes to the altar of the Lord together. As a church that wants to see revival, not satisfied with the status quo. Amen. Not satisfied with just coming in week in, week out, just for the sake of doing it. But that we would be growing and maturing so that from this place, God can raise up pastors, evangelists, teachers, leaders, Mature Christians, wherever they are, that can spread the good news of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what's supposed to happen in a church where God is moving. It's not you come to meet and then we all go to our separate ways. God has a plan for each one of our lives. And I'll tell you what the plan is. It's not your job. It's not the letters after your name from a lot of schooling. Whatever God leads you to do, do it with all of your heart as if working for the Lord and not for men, for his praise and for his glory. But that's not it, you know. These are all temporary things. Seeking God and seeking his will to be done on earth is the eternal things that the Bible tells us to concentrate on. So I want us to get some prayer partners, men with men and women with women, and let's pray that God will begin to repair whatever needs to be repaired in our altars with the Lord. Amen? Let's do that for a few moments. Let's ask God to help us tonight. I'm excited about going to the altar of the Lord. Amen? Let's, let's pray for a few moments and then I'll come back. <laughs>